Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our study on the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Sorry about the, uh, the delay here, <clears throat> getting things up and ready. Um, got a couple of technical difficulties here. So just give me half a second to finish pulling up some things. Uh, we are going to be talking today about the letters to the churches, which is uh, Revelation uh, chapters 2 and 3. So that'll be our, our topic today. And uh, let's see here. Yep, there it is right there. Our topic today, Revelation, Hope in a Catholic World, and session 3, Letters to the Churches. So you may recall from last uh, excuse me, from last week that prologue introducing the risen Jesus, who is, is this massive figure in the book of Revelation. And then this Jesus uh, sends three short letters, dictates three short letters to seven churches. They're all in the area of Asia Minor, uh, what we would know as, as Western Turkey. And um, they are all sort of within the sphere of influence of Ephesus. So uh, the author John would have known them and uh, been a bishop to them, overseer to them, sort of regional regional pastor to them. The seven is, of course, a symbolic number, again, referring to the, the fullness of the church. So although there are specific local details in these things, um, more than that, they are addressed to the churches. We'll see that in the text in a few minutes here. And that's important as well, that they're addressed also to us. Um, and to understand the letters, uh, we have to sort of understand the background into which they were written. And um, this, this may become uncomfortable for us modern Christians, um, but I think that's okay. I think it's good for us to examine some things that are sometimes difficult. Um, so the thing I would like to start with today is um, the background for these letters. And that is what we call a Roman civil religion. Um, so in the ancient world, really until the modern era, um, un until the enlightenment in the 17 and 1800s, religion and the state always went together. Now, there was no such thing as separation of church and state. There was no such thing that, that the state existed independently of of the, uh, the religions around it. Um, so, so Rome as an empire is really wrapped up in, in religion. Um, one of the underlying values of this is uh, how Rome sees their relationship to the gods. Um, the gods favor Rome, the gods smile on Rome. That is why Rome is so successful. And of course, by the time uh, Revelation is being written about 100 AD, uh, Rome is hugely successful. They've been around for six, 700 years. Uh, they've got several hundred more years to go. Uh, they control everything from Great Britain in the West all the way to modern day Syria in the East. The gods have smiled on Rome. Um, and in order to assert that, you see Romans doing a couple of things. You may recall from middle school uh, myth, uh, mythology classes, whenever you studied that, that uh, the, we know the Greek gods pretty well, but they all have a Roman counterpart. So Zeus, Jupiter, right? Um, and uh, Ares, the god of war on the Greek side, and, and Mars, the god of war on the, uh, on the uh, uh, Roman side. Hades, the god of the underworld on, uh, on the Greek side is Uranus, the god of the underworld. Um, on the other side. So over and over again, we have these, these, these things, these overlaps, because wherever the Romans went, they incorporated the religions into their own pantheon, and therefore all the gods of the world smiled on them, because one of the things they said was basically, your gods are our gods, and these gods are smiling on us. And that's testified to in the way that, that Rome went about business. Every Roman city had a ton of, of shrines um, and um, uh, shrines to the various gods. And 
you would uh, go to the, these temples to, to read the auguries before you went to battle, before you made a major decision. Uh, there was sacrifice before a major decision or before a battle, invoking the gods' uh, pleasure. And it was important that we see this as a civic duty. You didn't just do this, the priest alone in the temple, but the entire community gathered around and they were offering the sacrifice together. So for example, when, when Jews and Christians then pulled back from that, they were considered subversive. It's not just that they were following a different God, it's that they weren't uh, doing the rites and the rituals that would invoke the God's favor on Rome. Uh, so participation in these idols is important. And these idol temples are also, um, I've talked about this in different forms before, they're an important source of, of social connection and meat. Uh, they didn't really have butcher shops as we know butcher shops, I mean, Jewish people did. But in general, the meat that was available was meat that had been sacrificed in one of these idol temples. So uh, it was a source of nutrition. It was sort of like a combination deli and restaurant. People would eat in the precincts of these temples. There was a lot going on that made you socially noticeable and politically viable if you participated in these temples. So uh, the, the temple atmosphere was, was super important to them. Add to that uh, the cult of the emperor that... Uh, Romans thought of their emperor as in some ways divine. So uh, there's a number of words for God in Latin and the gods like Zeus, he is Deus, he is God um, with a kind of Charlton Heston intonation, right, God. Um, Caesar is, is divas. It, it's sort of a lesser deity, but it's still a deity. And therefore, one of the things that became very common across the empire in this era was that as a sort of show of loyalty, you would burn incense to the emperor. Um, you would offer a, a, an offering to him, a religious offering to him as to a god. And again, uh, now this is later on, this is maybe 150 years after Revelation is written, Offering set, uh, incense to the image of the emperor became an important test of loyalty. Will you do this or won't you do this? Are you a loyal uh, Roman or are you not? Um, and of course, as Christians refused to do that, seeing that as uh, going one step too far, they were widely persecuted. So the underlying question that the Christians are struggling with is how do we live in this kind of a world, a world that is swimming in idolatry, a world in which you, you can't turn around, you can't do anything without being confronted by some sort of uh, false faith, false belief. And um, you know, so, so Christians are figuring this out and they're, they're figuring out what they have to resist and how they have to resist and whether they can eat the idol meat or not. I mean, Paul is dealing with this 40 years before, before the book of Revelation in 1 Corinthians. It is an ongoing struggle. What can we participate in and what we cannot participate in? And does there come a moment at which we're actually accommodated? That is, that we've actually compromised something essential about ourselves. So that is, that is the background um, of Roman civil religion. Now, I suggested that this would get a little uncomfortable, and I think it needs to get a little uncomfortable because America also has a civil religion. Uh, we, we, we brag about the separation of church and state, but if we pay careful attention, we see these moments when we are actually making the state... Uh, quasi-deified. I mean, it's like, it, it's like it, it's got a religious veneer over it. Um, and if you don't believe me, let's just look at a few things here. Um, sacred symbols and sacred spaces. Um, so, of course, the greatest sacred symbol in the U.S. is uh, the flag. And if you want to cause trouble for somebody, uh, just desecrate the flag, right? That is sure to raise up 
all sorts of trouble. Remember uh, 20, 25 years ago, a lot of talk about constitutional amendment to make sure no one can burn the flag. And if that's not a sacred symbol, I don't know what is. Um, in that same time frame, in the, in the mid nineties, um, there was some artist who, who one of his pieces was a, a crucifix in a jar of urine. And, and Christians were, were just incensed about that. And you know, maybe rightly so, it's desecrating our chief symbol. But we feel the same way about the flag that we do with the cross. And I would suggest that sometimes we even get hotter about the flag than we do about the cross. Um, we have sacred rituals and holy days. Um, you know, if you think about the controversies that have eaten us up around, say, the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance is, it's in some ways a religious document, a religious statement. It, it sort of is our creed. This is who we are, one nation under God, you know, um, and it's the under God that we have fought about. Should that be in there or not? Because for a lot of Americans, this is a quasi-religious statement. Uh, same thing with Holy Days. Um, the one that stands out to me is, of course, Memorial Day, um, when we honor our war dead. And, and just sort of think through the ways that that, that has sort of a ritualistic and um, uh, religious tone to it. Sacred language. Um, that we have, we have certain languages that we use. Um, we, we do this with our military a lot. We speak of military as mission. Um, we, we, we sanctify honor and duty and make it sound like uh, biblical values, biblical virtues. So there's a lot of that language around there that becomes quasi-religious. Sacred music, of course, the national anthem. Um, and we know how we feel about this, you know. Um, Colin Kaepernick takes a knee during the national anthem and he can't find a job anymore. Um, you know, there are certainly NFL clubs in the last several years that could have used his athletic services, but they chose not to because he had desecrated the sacred song. Remember all that, all that hubbub around that. Sacred texts, um, the Constitution, many of us can recite parts of the Constitution from memory, uh, the preamble, uh, we can cite parts of the Declaration of Independence from memory, the Gettysburg Address. So we have a collection of sacred texts. Sacred stories of sacred leaders, you know, honest, uh, um, honest George Washington who couldn't tell a lie, but cut down the cherry tree, that sort of mythology that grows up. And if, if this is enough to, uh, to convince you that we have a civil religion that encroaches on our actual religion, then I offer you simply this picture right here. And um, I don't know if you know what that is, that is a photograph from the bottom of the Capitol Rotunda, um, as you look straight up uh, from the center of the rotunda. And this, uh, this fresco is entitled, The Apotheosis of Washington. And apotheosis is the word that described how the emperors became divine. So we live in a very similar kind of world. Um, there are loyalty tests that we, that we honor that demand um, split allegiances. Do you, honor, do you honor the state and its religious uh, notions, or do you stand apart from them uh, because you have a king who is different than, than Caesar? Do you have a different ruler? Do you live under a different order of things? So one of the things I'd like to show is that although maybe some of the issues are different from the day of revelation to today, the underlying problems are still the same. How do you live in this kind of a world? So to start with, we'll, we're gonna look at the letters and the first letter that we look at is the letter to Ephesus. So I'm gonna read these letters just so that we have them in our head. And I'm going to make a little bit of commentary along the way as we go. So if you have your Bible uh, to Revelation chapter 2, uh, that's where we're going to be right now. So uh, I'm reading an NIV. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Um, angel. Um, each of these is addressed to an angel. Um, 
they could be a reference to like uh, a divine, uh, a, a spiritual being. Um, they could be a reference to like an angel, like we usually think of that. And maybe the idea is, is that there is a guardian angel assigned to, to each church. That's possible. Uh, one of my dear professors uh, thought this was a case where some lines were being blurred and um, angel here actually refers to the pastors of these churches. Um, so however we take that, we see what we saw last week with mediation. This is typical um, of apocalyptic literature, God to Jesus, to a messenger of some sort, uh, whether spiritual or human, and then onto the churches. But that, that sort of mediation, we'll see that all the way through. Um, as we look at this letter to the church of Ephesus, um, we will also note um, a, a, sort, a certain pattern that happens. There is always a description of, of Jesus who is giving uh, the messages. Then there is usually a commendation an, an attaboy of each of these churches. There is usually some sort of a condemnation or a something to work on for each of the churches. And there is a closing exhortation, a closing encouragement to be faithful. So kind of four parts in each of these. With the uh, introductions of Jesus, we'll see that for all seven letters, the introduction has something to do with the way Jesus was described in chapter one. So it kind of uh, floats back to chapter one and connects closely to, to Jesus in chapter one. So at the church in Ephesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. So this is the guardian of the church, right? He, he's in the midst of his churches, and he sustains the seven stars with the seven angels. So he sustains the, the messengers to the churches. Um, I, I kind of lean towards the, the, the pastoral idea of that. So churches and pastors and Jesus is sustaining and walking in the midst of them. <clears throat> Verse uh, two, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So there's the commendation. They have stuck to it. They have stayed with the faith. They have challenged and, uh, and fought and endured. Um, yet I hold this against you, verse four. You have forsaken the love you had at first. So, I rather imagine this as a marriage. Um, and you've, you know, we've all heard of like the seven year itch um, that marriages sort of go through phases. And in my experience of working with couples, um, you sort of have a, a time of trouble called that seven year itch when you've been married for a while and now you've got little kids at home and you're sort of losing connection with each other. The next major place that you have uh, I see marriage trouble is as the kids get older and you start to approach empty nest. And a lot of times identity has been wrapped up in raising children and now children don't need to get raised as much. So what you have is you have husbands and wives who have stuck it out. They have endured through 20 and 25 years of marriage. Uh, they have raised their kids. They have done what is right. And I often hear when I have couples in this stage of marriage come talk to me, that they don't remember if they love each other or not. They've been so wrapped up in other tasks that they've sort of forgotten whether they love each other. It's a real challenge sometimes at that point. And I, I think that's what, what this letter is getting at. It's driving at this idea that um, they, they persevere, they, they've stayed married, but in some ways they've forgotten their love. And it seems to me they've probably forgotten their love for each other. That's the love they've forgotten. So they have uh, congregationally uh, grown apart from each other and they need to think that through. Um, repent and do the things you did at first. Become the same family that you were at first. And if you do not repent, there's a threat. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I'll, I'll remove your church is what he's saying there. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Uh, the Nicolaitans, um, a little bit hard to track down. 
Um, I think our identification of him comes from, I, I want to say the church father Irenaeus, I would have to check the commentaries on that, um, who said that the Nicolaitans were sort of a um, uh, libertarian strain of Christianity, um, kind of rem reminiscent of Romans 6. Where, where Paul poses the question, shall we go on sinning so that God can forgive all the more? And he says, of course not, but well, we can't do that. And yet there were some Christians who seemed to think, well, if God for, you know, forgives everything, then sin's not a big deal. And um, uh, certainly um, sexual uh, activity is not a big deal. So the Nicolaitans seem to have been a, a small sect that, that was what we call uh, libertarian or libertine in nature. Finally, verse seven. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the idea, whoever has ears, let them hear, means that this is addressed to everyone. And that is underscored by the churches. And that the Spirit is the one who is speaking through these angels, through these messengers, to these churches. Uh, to the one who is victorious, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. A reference back to Genesis 2 and 3 and forward to the end of the book. So um, remember your first love. Don't become, don't work by habit. You know, so he commends them for their faithfulness, but now he encourages them to remember to love one another and to be kind to one another. That's the church in Ephesus. Um, the church in Smyrna is next. That also is in Revelation chapter two. Um, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life. And we talked about that last week in chapter one. The commendation, I know your affliction and your poverty, and yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Um, what's missing here is a condemnation. So we have the commendation, the attaboy, but not the you better, um, because they are afflicted, afflicted and poor. Um, there's some question about what this means that they, uh, those who say they are Jews and are not, sort of, I think two ways you could understand that. Um, it's possible that you had Jewish people in some of these cities who set aside their distaste for the Romans in order to collude with the Romans to get rid of the Christians. Um, so they say they're Jews, but they're not really separate from the world. Um, they're accommodated to the world. Uh, you, you see this uh, in the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, no Jews in Jerusalem liked Rome. They didn't like Pontius Pilate, but um, he was useful to them when they wanted to get rid of Jesus. And so they, they, they kind of kissed up. Uh, in that in that account. That might be one thing here. They say they're Jews, but they're really accommodated with the powers of the empire, um, and therefore um, they're not really Jews. Or it could be a way of saying, um, of, of claiming the Old Testament, to say that it might be a way of Christians saying, we are the genuine descendants of Abraham, and you who are Jews have forsaken that because you've denied Jesus. Uh, so two different ways to take this. Um, pretty clearly, it's still Jews who are persecuting, which shouldn't surprise us because we saw that all through the book of Acts. Jewish persecution gave way after 70 AD to Roman persecution, but it doesn't take any stretch of the imagination to imagine that, that Jews still hated Christians, even at the same time that they were hated. Uh, this idea of suffering for 10 days, 10 is another one of those symbolic numbers. So last week we had seven as the symbolic number. Uh, that's the number of the fullness of, of God, the sort of God's plans and purposes. So a sevenfold spirit and seven churches, um, you know, seven angels. Uh, ten, ten is the number of earthly power and earthly completeness. So it is a number about empire. Um, so suffering for 10 days is a way of saying, um, you'll suffer at the hands of the empire and you'll suffer uh, because of the strength of the empire. So, so 10 has this sort of empire sense to it. 
Um, and then the commendation, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as a victor's crown. But there's somebody out there for whom that's their confirmation verse. Whoever has ears, let them hear again. Uh, what the spirit says to churches, that's a kind of a refrain through these letters. And the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. I will come back to that. Uh, the second death would be final judgment, final punishment. So the first death would be uh, if uh, when we die uh, mortally, the second death would be on judgment day, those who go into everlasting condemnation. So the first one, uh, you're doing good, um, but you got to love each other. The second one, um, hang in there. We understand that your resistance to the to the world around you has caused you trouble, um, but hang in there. Uh, thirdly, we come to the church in Pergamum. Um, here, Jesus is described as the one with the two-edged sword um, coming out of his mouth, as you recall from chapter one. Uh, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Um, so apparently, um, relying on this little book right here, um, which looks like it's backwards in your screen, um, great little book um, on Revelation. And uh, he notes that Pergamum had a very large temple of Zeus, a very prominent temple of Zeus. So for example, um, not every city had every shrine. Ephesus was known for its, um, its temple of Artemis. Um, Pergamum apparently was known for its temple of Zeus. That's why uh, Satan has his throne there. It's like, here's the chief of those Roman gods. So uh, this is a way of, of identifying Pergamum. Um, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Um, so Antipas apparently is a uh, martyr uh, that the church in Pergamum would have known as part of their church. So it is, you, you sort of see a ratcheting up. Um, in the previous one, they're put in prison for 10 days, but here there has been an actual, what we would call martyrdom. Um, someone has actually died uh, for the faith. Um, and they re remained true through that, uh, remained true to the name. Yet, he says, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. So they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Uh, so if you recall from Numbers, the story of Balaam, he is a, a foreign prophet. And Balak, uh, one of the kings that is confronting Israel as they enter the promised land, brings him in to curse the people of Israel. And he tells, the, he tells him, you know, I'll give you a great deal of money if you call down a curse on the Israelites. And they go up and they look at the Israelites from a vantage point and Balaam, uh, God tells Balaam, don't curse them. And they go up to a different vantage point and God tells Balaam, don't curse them. A different vantage point and God uh, tells Balaam, don't curse them. The thing with Balaam is, is that he really wants the payday. Uh, so he, he's trying to have it both ways. This comparison to Balaam is, is about accommodation and trying to play both parts. So on the one hand, he, he's listening to the God of Israel and he's not pronouncing curse on them. But at the end of the story, it's his idea to introduce them to Baal worship. And part of Baal worship um, was, was sexual in nature. Um, a lot of ancient religions had a sexual component, but the idea was is that Baal is the god of the thunderstorm. Asherah, his consort, is the goddess of fertility and the fields. And when they had sex up in the heavens, the rain came down and the crops came up. And to encourage them to, to make love, you went to the temple and you had sex yourself. So there was this phenomenon of cultic prostitution. Um, a, a lot of times in the Old Testament, we bump into the word prostitute. It's not just a moral choice. It's not just, you know, the oldest profession in the world, but it's, it's women who are actually in service to, to idols, to, to national gods. And um, the prostitution they're engaged in is, um, is to encourage fertility in the fields. Uh, so Balaam, uh, excuse me, yeah, Balaam 
uh, introduces Israel to Baal worship and then leads them into sexual immorality. Uh, this We're going to hear about food sacrifice to idols and sexual immorality a lot. And we need to hear them both against the background of, of this sort of cultic activity that, that these are idolatrous sorts of things that are going on. Not that it excuses sexual misbehavior in our day um, when it doesn't have a idolatrous sort of thing, um, but there's this sort of added layer into, into a lot of ancient writing. All right, so you tolerate, you hold to the teaching of Balaam, you're trying to have it both ways. Um, you, and likewise, you hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. There's where um, the sexual activity is, is not religious in nature. It's just indulging your, your basest instincts. Um, so they've, they've got some problems apparently with sex and they're trying to have it both ways, to live in the Roman world and to uh, still call themselves Christians. They're trying to uh, do both things and it's gonna eventually be a problem. So verse 16, repent therefore, Otherwise, I'll come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Um, here there is the promise of hidden manna. I'm not really sure what to make of that, although I suspect it's ultimately a callback to the fact that they put a bowl of manna inside the Ark of the Covenant. So there's some promise here that they will live in the presence of God. I suspect that's the, the thrust of the white stone with a new name written on it as well is that they have an identity that is that is God's to, to understand. All right, that's the first three churches. Fourthly, we have the church of Thyatira. Um, again, eyes like blazing uh, fire, feet like burnished bronze from chapter one. Um, Thyatira is a little different than Ephesus. I know your deeds, your love, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent, but she is unwilling, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering. Um, probably Jezebel is a symbolic way of referring to someone that the church in Thyatira would have actually known. Uh, some sort of a teacher who is actually a false teacher. And, and you see again the, the, the continuity of the issue. Eating food sacrificed to idols, so participating in that, that temple life, and sexual immorality, which is both sometimes religious and sometimes not. Romans did not have a particularly uh, faithful view of sex. Um, it was completely normal for a um, a Roman man, a Roman citizen especially, uh, to be able to have sex with the slaves if he wanted to, um, and to be able to have sex around. Um, so it was very chauvinistic in the sense that women didn't have the same prerogative, but um, it, was, it was a different sexual culture, which is why we read so much about it in the New Testament. Anyhow, so there's, there's toleration of false teaching in their midst, and uh, this is the thing that is, is uh, of, of issue for God. Uh, so verse 24, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, you do not hold to her teaching. Um, I will not impose any other burden on you. Hold on to what you have. So um, love, stay active in love for one another. Um, endure persecution, uh, letters three and four, or two and three rather. Um, avoid false teaching here in, in letter four. And that leads us to letter five, uh, to the church in Sardis. Um, here's the sevenfold spirit of God. Um, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Um, so now we have a warning to a church that um, has gone so far as to have even lost the spark of, of life from them. Um, so they need to wake up. A, a call for resurrection, really, if they're dead, then waking up is to come to new life. This is going to take the work of the spirit. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. So they're not exactly dead. Um, <laughs> kind of sounds a little bit like um, uh, the princess bride. He's mostly dead, but partly alive. So um, there are some things that are about to die that they need to strengthen. 
um, their deeds are unfinished. They have, have had a good start, but they have not carried through. And the, then there's the warning. If you don't wake up, I'll come like a thief in the night and you won't know when. Um, apparently Sardis had a, uh, a citadel on a hill and uh, a couple of times in their history, uh, they thought that was impregnant impregnable, but a couple of times in their history, troops came over the top of it and, and attacked the city. So that may be in the background here of one who, who sneaks in like a thief. Um, there are a few, there are, there's a remnant. Um, and uh, that language of a remnant, so verse four, you have a few people in Sardis who've not sil uh, soiled their clothes. Um, reminiscent of Elijah complaining to the Lord, uh, I'm the only prophet left. And the Lord's reply is, I've retained for myself 7,000 in Israel. Um, as if to say, you're not so alone as you, you may think you actually are. Uh, there are a few left. And this, so uh, here is a church that is struggling deeply, but there is a remnant of the faithful ones. And they are urged to, to fan and to flame their faith. Number six is the Church of Philadelphia. This is chapter three, verse seven. Um, what he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. And he says, see, I, I know your deeds and I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. Um, here again is another letter where there is no condemnation. This is similar to uh, the church of Pergamum, excuse me, Smyrna. Uh, they were suffering and uh, persevering under that suffering, and there was no condemnation for them. And here in Philadelphia, again, um, no condemnation because they have uh, patiently endured the trial that is going on around them. Um, and the trial, again, is standing aside from this culture, this, this, this religious culture around them. Um, and the promise, verse 11 there, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. And the one who is victorious, the one who overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. And that calls ahead to verse, chapters 21 and 22. Lastly, last couple of minutes here, we have uh, to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Uh, now, Laodicea, let's just read it. Uh, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. Um, so you are lukewarm, and therefore I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Um, as I recall, the verb there is a little more graphic than that. I'm pretty sure the verb is vomit. Uh, so it, it's a pretty dramatic kind of phrase here. Um, and it's not that we are to be sort of passionately against Christ or passionately for Christ. That's not what the hot or cold means. Um, Apparently, Laodicea was close to hot springs with therapeutic effects. Um, and they also had to have water brought in via aqueduct uh, because their own water was polluted. So it seems like the cold water is the water of, you know, life-giving water. The hot water is the water of the hot springs, also life-giving, health rejuvenating. The lukewarm is um, the... Uh, the bad water of Laodicea. Um, it's not good for you. So I think that's what's going on here. Um, you know, he wants some passion. He wants some life-giving benefit, um, but they're not, they're, there's no life-giving benefit in this church. Um, you say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing, but you don't realize that actually you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Um, so apparently the, the riches that they've bought into are the riches of being socially connected in this idolatrous world. And they don't even recognize that they have given away the true treasures, which are the treasures of faith um, by, doing, by doing this. So you have these, these warnings and uh, commendations uh, that paint a picture of a church, churches that are trying to figure out, again, as I said before, how they are going to manage this this difference between um excuse me i run back here real quick resistance 
and accommodation. How will you find this balance? Now, the book of Revelation is pretty clearly arguing for much more separation than these churches are currently giving. Um, so it, it's interesting. Um, when you read about this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 8 and 9, um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is struggling with the question of, of, of idol meat. He says, well, you know, on the one hand, an idol is nothing at all. On the other hand, he's like, well, it could be demonic. So, you know, I'm not really sure what you're supposed to do here. And his attitude seems to be, well, for the strong in faith, they see that there's nothing there at all. So it's not a problem for them to eat the meat. Um, don't participate in this in the ceremony, but it's okay to eat the meat. The weak in faith who struggle with that and, and see something demonic there, they shouldn't eat the meat. And then later on, he comes back with a sort of attitude that says, you know, and if you're strong, but you're eating the meat is offending the weak, then you shouldn't eat the meat. Um, so, so Paul kind of seems to dance around the issue a little bit, um, settling on, you know, it might be okay, but for the sake of the brother who doesn't think it's okay, you really need to stop it. Um, John in Revelation uh, seems uh, much more stringent. Uh, you need to separate from this world. You need to stop participating in this, this kind of idolatry. Um, so he, he seems to be calling for a much more uh, strict um, resistance to the world. And I suppose part of the problem is balance, right? Um, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Hauser was using the illustration of of, of balancing on a bicycle, learning to ride a bicycle. Um, and the thing that I, I was thinking about when he preached that sermon was to maintain that balance is a constant thing. You have to train yourself to correct constantly, but not overcorrect. You know, when you're first learning, you're overcorrecting. So you're lurching back and forth. You never find that center of balance. When you're a good bicycle rider, you've sort of formed this core and you've learned to make very small adjustments to main, maintain the center. Um, and I think maybe that's how we should have envisioned the problem. The problem is, is that maintaining balance between being in the world but not of the world demands constant attention. Constant attention that our hearts are dedicated to the things of God and that we don't overvalue the things of man. And I, I think that's the place that we really get into. Um, we don't even see when the values of man work against or outright contradict the things of God. And uh, I think that's the place that we have to sort of watch, watch ourselves a little bit. Um, we'll talk more about the nature of this accommodation when we start to see how John sees the very nature of empire, of, of this, this sort of religious empire. And that's in chapters 6 through 20. So we'll have a chance to come back to that. Next week, um, we start looking at the, the central and centering vision. And that is uh, a look into the very throne room of God, which will then cast us forward into the visions. So next week, chapters 4 and 5. And then after that, we'll start looking at the visions themselves. So thanks for coming out today. Remember, you're standing... Uh, assignment. If you want, if you really want to understand Revelation, uh, read the thing chapter one through chapter 22 in one sitting, if you can, um, each week. All right. Well, thanks for your time today. God bless. And we will see you hopefully again next week.